get started with uh, the introductions and all that stuff, get it out of the way. Um, so we try to make up time. So uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Brendan Morrison. So I'm originally from Ketchikan, Alaska, a uh, small town. Uh, I grew up kind of moving around a lot. My dad joined the Navy when I was about two or three years old. Uh, so I kind of grew up all over the place. Uh, my dad was Navy. I was Army, which kind of kept me moving. Um, and I came to Denver, Colorado in 2017. Uh, trying to set roots, stay in one place. Uh, and then in 2019, I started my financial services company uh, and now uh, offer uh, financial services uh, in Denver or in Colorado, as well as a few other states as well, uh, including Alaska. Um, I work with a lot of different communities, uh, do make career professionals, career retirees, small business benefits. And obviously, I uh, do a lot of work with indigenous communities as well. Um, I'm originally, uh, my dad's side, I'm from Simshian Nation, uh, which is primarily in British Columbia and uh, Ketchikan, Alaska area, uh, where I come from is where you find most of the Simshians. So um, a little bit about this workshop. So I took from a... Um, uh, it's a presentation that we do as part of a group that it, I organize along with a business partner of mine, Kathleen Phillips. So the group is FIAD 101. Uh, we actually have a website now, uh, FIAD, FIAD 101.com. So that's F I E D 101.com. Um, get into it, uh, why we did it. We just think that there really needs to be more financial literacy, uh, more good financial literacy. Uh, and it should be a lot more accessible. So um, we're building it out. We're working uh, to make that a lot more available for people. Uh, so we cover topics, everything from estate planning to planning for educational costs and everything in between. Uh, so the presentation we will we'll go through today uh, is really about uh, the building a financial foundation. It's really, it's kind of a over bird's eye view of uh, financial planning. Uh, it's really uh, where to get started and what are kind of the basics on that. But um, if you go on our website, we have other presentations and stuff like that that we're trying to get up there. We cover a wide range of uh, different topics. A um, little bit on the basics. Uh, questions are more than welcome. Uh, there should be a chat feature if you want to, uh, for time's sake, if you want, as we go through this, if you want to ask your questions in the chat, uh, please do so there uh, so we can move uh, through the presentation. Then I will get through uh, the questions on the back end. Um, normally, uh, this uh, workshop is <laughs> we have a little bit more time and it runs long anyway. Uh, so to make time, uh, please just ask questions there and I'll do my best to answer questions uh, as I can. Um, I have a few questions for you as well. Uh, we use the polling feature. Uh, so there's a few pop quiz questions in there. Um, just take your best guess at it. Uh, it's no pressure or anything like that. Um, and then we have, so if you go to our website, the FIED101.com, uh, there are workbooks. And now we actually added a budgeting uh, Excel spreadsheet on there as well. Uh, it's a pre-made uh, spreadsheet. Uh, if you go to the website, they're free to download, no cost, no obligation, anything like that. Uh, feel free to accept that gift. Um, and goals from this really just to uh, you know help spread uh, financial education around there. Uh, the biggest thing is too is uh, there's a quote on the bottom there, a good idea without action withers on the vine. Uh, some, someone once said to me. As we go through this, uh, and I'll kind of uh, touch on more, is the biggest thing is just you know getting started, and, and you know having a great idea uh, doesn't really do anything if you don't put it into action. So um, I hope that you'll take some uh, ideas from this, and you know put those into action, and you know get started on a path. Uh, to really building a, a healthy uh, financial future for yourself. So um, 
Let's get into it. So my role today is to provide, provide you with information to help you start build a strong financial foundation uh, that can help you and uh, help you on your path to achieve your personal financial goals. So that's really what this presentation is about. A um, little bit about, uh, that's all my contact information. As I said before, I'm out of Denver, Colorado. Um, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out. My phone number and email address are in my website. Or one of my websites are up there as well. Um, like I said, I work out of Colorado. I'm licensed in quite a few states. I can actually I can practice just about anywhere. But um, if, if you have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to, to uh, reach out. Disclosure statement. Uh, Inside of FINRA rules, uh, information presented, nor express constitutes solicitation. And I, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely not here to sell you anything or anything like that. But um, I'm a financial professional, so we'll talk about a lot of products that you know in my practice I do sell, uh, and we'll talk on some stuff, uh, tax, legal, uh, accounting advice, that kind of stuff. I am not a uh, tax attorney. I am not a um, legal attorney or uh, accountant or anything like that. I'm a financial professional and all investments, that kind of stuff. Um, if you have any, uh, you know, uh, deeper questions on that kind of stuff, consult the appropriate professional before making any decisions. Um, that's just not my avenue is uh, maintained from the disclosure. So. so let's get into it. So. The thing I really like about this workshop is it kind of takes a lot of different concepts and breaks it down into uh, you know a more simple concept. So uh, think of your finances as a house. So uh, I would when I was a teenager, I actually or I used to work construction. So um, yeah, you know, built some projects and stuff. And when you start a project, you always start from the foundation uh, and build up from there. Uh, so when talking in terms of a uh, financial house, when we talk protection, that's going to be things, uh, you know, making sure for the uncertainties of life, uh, just uh, being prepared for whatever can get thrown at you, uh, that you can make the adjustment and, you know, be able to hang on. Uh, when we talk accumulation, that's more the investments. Uh, it's what I would consider the more fun part. Uh, it's weighing long-term investment goals versus short-term investment goals, that kind of stuff. Um, preservation is the roof or the cap on top is going to be more what you do with uh, at the end. You know, what you do with um, ensuring your um, wealth in retirement goals, um, passing it on through legacy, uh, you know, making sure that all the savings and everything you did throughout your lifetime are, you know, going to provide a uh, healthy, comfortable retirement for you uh, while you're in your golden years, uh, that kind of stuff. So that's what we mean when, uh, when we talk in terms of the financial house of uh, protection, accumulation, preservation. So um, to start now, uh, the budgeting basics, uh, and the most basic concept um, is uh, cash flow. So you hear a lot of people talk cash flow. It's you know what you can. It's money available that you have uh, to uh, do what you will with. So what a lot of people um, unfortunately do is you know spend the frivolous things or Starbucks that kind of stuff. Um, it's the the extra money that you have available. So. Calculating your actual cash flow uh, is taking your household income uh, minus your household expenses. So your rent, mortgage, um, you know, car payment, car insurance, um, food, all of the, you know, the, the real key expenses and whatever's left over, that's your cash flow. Um, uh, I use a software or I have, I've, Use the software for years uh, called it's mint.com, uh, M I N T. There's a lot of really good budgeting software out there right now um, that kind of help you uh, put stuff together. As I mentioned, we also have a spreadsheet 
available on uh, on my website. Um, that's kind of offline if you're more comfortable with that. But the main thing is is you know being realistic with your uh, spending targets. So I started using Mint years ago for uh, the career I'm in now. The big thing that I realized uh, with using it is I would set a goal on you know eating out or that kind of stuff and blow right through it because uh, with Mint it, it automatically shows you how much you're actually spending on each category. And I would set what I thought was reasonable and find out that it wasn't even close. Um, budgets only work if you're being realistic in how much you're actually spending. Um, and then staying in bounds with, uh, with that budget. Um, the, the goal is to, de- is to determine your cash flow so that you can use that cash flow uh, for you know, your, your various options um, and deviate that more towards investments, we would hope, that kind of stuff. But if you're not being realistic on how much your household expenses really are, uh, your cash flow is going to be flawed if that makes sense. So um, sitting down, budgeting can be, it can be a long process. Like when I first started using some of this, it was a little bit of trial and error of, you know, how much you think you spend on something per month, Uh, you know, two, three months in, you've realized that's like close to what you actually spend. You either need to change your habits or if it's something that's an actual real, um, a real expense, you need to adjust the budget to fit that, and that's going to affect your cash flow, and that's going to affect the options you have for your investments. Um, but this is a crucially important step uh, to really figuring that out, so that any investments you make or um, anything you do with that cash flow, you can do comfortably, because uh, it's not going to affect your household expenses and not going to affect your lifestyle or anything like that. So speaking on that. Um, what we do with that cash flow, uh, unfortunately, nowadays, uh, a lot of people are uh, spend first, save last mentality. Uh, if you get anything from this workshop, it's to really shift that into a save first, spend last mentality. So the big uh, change of point for me, I guess, was realizing and i definitely was you know a spend first save last type of person you know spend on the starbucks and video games and all that kind of stuff uh and just what was a what was left over maybe uninvested or if there was even anything left over um i realized in doing that what you're effectively doing is the money that you're you're spending that on on frivolous things the starbucks the the video game companies, all of them, they're getting the money first and you're paying yourself last if you're paying yourself at all. So when you think of terms of an investing, you're paying yourself, your, your future self, you're, you're giving yourself options in the future. And if you have a save first, spend last mentality, you're putting yourself at the front of that line. You get paid first, the other companies get paid last. Um, and that's, once you kind of realize that, you, you realize that that, how in, incredibly important that is to, you know, make sure that you're putting yourself in front of the line, like Starbucks can wait, they're gonna be okay. <laughs> they're gonna get money. Um, you need to pay yourself first uh, before, you know, paying others. So that was a, a big, um, a, a, realization for me and um i think that's something that needs to to go around a little bit more is that if you're in a save first spend last mentality you're really paying yourself first and if you're in the opposite you're you're paying corporations and you're paying everyone else first uh and you come last uh and that's not a good position to be in uh you definitely want to be putting yourself in the front of that line of who's going to pay it first. So, so when we talk uh, foundation of the house, uh, we talk in terms of protection. So this is just protection against whatever life can throw at you. 
uh, making sure that you're uh, financially stable and making sure that your lifestyle and family are protected um, as you go through life. So there's kind of, there's a lot of different, we call them bricks or blocks uh, to the foundation uh, for this analogy. Uh, the biggest one that I touch on uh, is the emergency savings. So each one of these blocks is important, but they're not all um, in, in, uh, immediately urgent. Uh, emergency savings is dead center on top for a reason because uh, it is urgent and it is important. Um, what emergency savings does is uh, effectively help keep the person out of debt is the, the key idea. So you can see the, the rest on there, you know, all of these are, are very important things, but I would say the, uh, the emergency savings is one that I will go back to a lot uh, just because it's something that's often skipped over, but is so critically important. And I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit more here in a bit, but the main thing it does is help keep people out of debt. And there's kind of a debt spiral uh, going on in the country right now where people get into debt and that interest starts to work against them, which causes them to get into more debt and just spirals and spirals and spirals. Uh, emergency savings uh, can kind of nip that in the bud and, and keep people out of debt in the first place. Uh, and have interest working for them rather than against them. But I would say every one of the, uh, these on here is important and they're just not all, uh, it's just kind of order of importance as you uh, go through them. So um, one that is uh, often overlooked, uh, I would say in a lot of people have the misnomer that uh, family estate planning is only for very wealthy families. Um, it's not at all true, especially nowadays. Uh, there's so many different resources um, for simple things like a will. Um, I think nowadays you can go online and get a will for next to nothing or nothing. Um, there's plenty of lawyers around towns too. They'll sit down with you and do it for a very reasonable price. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, you know, set that up, um, that will save a lot of heartache, uh, if something were to happen to you. So, um, what they call a person passing away, uh, without any, uh, will or anything like that in place, uh, the legal term is called dying interstate, uh, that means that the court decides what happens to your assets or, or if you have children, what happens to the children. Everything goes through probate court and the courts basically decide what goes where, where what happens with the kids, etc. A simple piece of paper will say what you want to happen if anything were to happen uh, can help avoid all of that. Um, so setting stuff like that up, uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. They're very simple to do. Uh, I mean, if you have 15 minutes and a Wi-Fi connection after this presentation, you can probably write a will for yourself. Uh, and if anything does happen, it, it helps, uh, you know, make sure things go the, the way that you would want them to go. Another big one is power of attorney, especially if you have kids. This is a big one that we see if you're in an accident or you're in some way incapacitated. Uh, basically says where the kids go if you're not able to take care of them uh, or you know, able to, if you're not conscious or able to say what, what you want to happen with them. Um, a power of attorney basically says, you know, who it takes over guardianship of the kids while you're incapacitated um, and all that kind of stuff. So it helps just clarify what you want to happen. Again, these are just simple legal documents. These are actually pretty easy to set up uh, and, and don't take too much time. Uh, and especially nowadays, like there's a lot of technology out there. Use the tools that are, that are available to you or, you know, um, better yet is, you know, sitting down with uh, a, a good attorney that uh, maybe uh, somebody knows that can help guide you through all this stuff. It doesn't, it's not a very long process to set this stuff up. 
it's really, you know, just telling uh, an attorney what you want or, you know, filling out a few forms online and boom, it's done. It, it doesn't take a lot of time um, and can save an enormous amount of heartache for loved ones and that kind of, and um, legal wrangling and if anything were to happen, um, whether you're incapacitated or were to pass away. So, but again, uh, with all things legal, always best to consult a uh, legal attorney. Um, emergency fund, and this is one that I, you know, touch on a lot is, um, so when we refer to emergency fund, typically we're going to refer to uh, either a savings account or money market fund or a combination of both or something like that. So uh, a bank savings fund or a money market fund uh, typically offered by a bank or investment uh, firm as well. What those both offer is that the money is both very safe and very easy to access. You can withdraw that money either instantly into your savings account or within a few days. Most financial professionals, uh, when they say retirement reti or emergency fund, rather, uh, talk in terms of three to six months of income. So, you know, whatever your, if you do your budget, that amount of income that you have coming in, three to six months worth of that, um, depending on whatever's more comfortable for you. If you're comfortable with three, or, or six months if you're more conservative. Um, I typically say two for self-employed people, you maybe want to lean more towards that six month because uh, you, you self-employed, I'm self-employed and <laughs> it definitely has its ups and downs. Uh, so you might need some extra cushion there. Um, the biggest intent on this though is that it helps avoid necessary debt. So if that car breaks or the you, something in the house happens or you know made a medical emergency or anything like that instead of having to put that on the credit card or you know hopefully not but like a payday loan or any type of debt or anything like that um rather than doing that you can just simply take the money from the emergency fund pay what you need to pay um start a plan to repay your own emergency fund to replenish that and everything is good and you're not in heavy debt. What happens when you take out a credit card or debt or anything like that is the interest is being charged against you. Especially the credit card, you're paying you know 20% on a $1,500 car repair or something like that, um, some uh, ridiculous amount. With an emergency fund, you're especially now since interest rates have gone up, uh, especially lately, uh, you're getting interest on your money that's in that savings account in that money market fund. So rather than the interest working against you in uh, the credit card, the interest is working for you in the emergency fund. Um, I've seen before where people will set up an emergency fund, start collecting interest every once in a while, take a withdrawal from that uh, emergency fund because they have the full six months or three months or whatever they want in the emergency fund, take that out, help add to a vacation fund or um, maybe clear a credit card or something like that. Just because they're just taking that interest off and using it for whatever. You're Instead of interest working against you, you're, you, you're getting interest to work for you. And that's the key um, major thing that our, an emergency fund can do for you. It's not glamorous or it's not, um, you know, a, a exciting thing or anything like that, but when you need it and it's there, it's amazing. So. And speaking of debt, uh, common sources of debt, big one, credit cards is when we talk about, uh, mortgage, student loans, car loans, and, uh, I touched on a little bit predatory debt. So it's going to be things like payday loans. Uh, stuff that has like an extremely high interest rate uh, for the uh, for the loan to pay out. So again, emergency savings account. What the best thing that will do for you is help avoid this. Is help avoid uh, the getting into a debt spiral. So average Americans, uh, a lot of them unfortunately are uh, kind of going into that. Debt, uh, the average American has a total debt of 96,371. 
Um, unfortunately, so we started doing this presentation a few or this workshop a few years ago. Uh, and it used to be, it was 92,000 and change, I believe back then. So unfortunately the amount of debt, the average amount of, of debt, uh, in the American household has actually gone up even since we just started doing these workshops. So again, uh, that's why I always really push on the emergency savings account is something that, uh, is easy that you can start today. That is easy to set up, um, start contributing to and start building uh towards that uh three to six uh, month goal um and, and having that as uh something to avoid this debt spiral uh because it has having such a, a big effect on uh the average american so another big one uh disability insurance and this kind of rolls in with emergency savings account so um one for uh of today's 20 year olds will become disabled at some point in his or her life. So you see this a lot, like uh, surgeons uh, are huge on this. Uh, really anyone that works with the hands, uh, you know, plumbers, uh, electricians, uh, anything like that. Uh, what disability insurance does is replace 50 to 70 percent of your income in case of serious illness or injury. So the big question is, you know, what, if you were to suddenly uh, have zero income, uh, you get in some sort of car accident or something like that where you can't work, your income drops to zero, you know, what would happen to your standard of living? If you have disability insurance, you're going to get 50 to 70 percent of your income anyway uh, once you file a claim on it hopefully you have an emergency uh savings as well that's going to help cover that gap as well uh so while you're on the mend healing up uh your, your financial situation is stable and safe you can focus on getting better rather than focus on um you know the panic of uh that situation uh and what it can do financially uh that's how a lot of these things can kind of work together uh, to help avoid uh, very serious issues. Uh, but disability insurance, um, more and more being offered by um, employers nowadays. The biggest thing is just to understand the terms of, you know, what exactly uh, are they offering? Um, and if there's like some sort of supplement or something like that, that uh, maybe should be added or could be added. Um, but at, at more and more, we're starting to see a lot of these are the ones being offered by employers are pretty good. Um, so the biggest thing is just seeing if your employer actually offers it, if you have to opt into it, what exactly you have there, um, and just what the terms are uh, with it. The biggest thing is there's, uh, with disability insurance, there might be what is called an elimination period. So an elimination period, say you have a 30 day elimination period, say I get in a car accident today, I file a claim the same day. My elimination period says that I can't start getting paid until 30 days from today. Um, what you see sometimes with these where people just like quickly sign stuff is some of these have elimination periods up to 180 days, uh, which is a very long time uh, to go zero income. Um, so just understanding uh, the ins and outs of what exactly is being offered to you uh with uh in terms of disability and insurance so, um long-term care insurance uh another very uh critical uh uh thing that we'll touch on so the difference between disability insurance and long-term care insurance so disability insurance implies that you're going to get better long-term care insurance less so so long-term care insurance is more uh for elderly people uh more towards the end of their lives who just need uh, medical assistance uh, for everyday tasks, uh, basically around, um, and uh, there's kind of an implication that they're probably not going to get better. They're older, and this is uh, you know uh, to help the, keep them comfortable uh, towards the end of their lives. Um, the biggest stat on there, so you know, forty percent chance. Uh, you know, a lot of people are going to. Uh, people uh, will need long-term care. It's becoming more and more frequent actually nowadays. 
Uh, but the biggest thing on there is that 50% of Americans incorrectly believe that Medicare will cover the costs of their long-term care events. So here's what happens with Medicare and long-term care insurance. There is um, a, uh, the financial term is called a spend down. So you have to spend down uh, to be able to get into uh, qualifying for Medicare. So spend down essentially means that you have to pay for your own care uh, and, and basically spend down your assets until you finally qualify for Medicare. So when I say spend down your assets, I don't mean the cash in your bank account. That means everything. So if you own your home, if, like, if you own land, if everything that you have, that what's often happening with this is people are needing to sell their homes, uh, do all these things to spend down uh, and to be able to get into Medicare, um, which is a, a pretty brutal way of doing that. So the the nice thing with long-term care is just being able to avoid all that. Um, long-term care insurance, uh, I, from my experience, the best time to start shopping from the, for this is you're going to see typically around um, your 40s or 50s is and like early 50s, I mean, is typically going to be the best time to look for long-term care insurance. Uh, it's just a lot of people start looking for this uh, well into their 60s or 70s, and by then it is very, very expensive. It gets expensive quickly. Um, but getting it at um, in that age range or like the 40s or 50s and looking for a type of product, more and more these are offering uh, uh, we're called return a premium. So it, essentially, if you pay into a long-term care insurance policy and you never do long-term care in your life, you can get everything you paid into it, you get back. Um, those are easier to set up when, if you get the policy in those younger years, in your 40s, 50s, you're healthier. Um, it, it's just when you're older, the insurance companies are taking on more risk they might not be as willing to offer something like that. So um, setting up something like that at that younger age in the 40s or 50s has uh, become critically important. And uh, why I touch on this a lot is what you're seeing more and more in, with retirement is that um, a lot of what's happening is people are doing getting to retirement, they've saved all this money, and nothing can destroy your retirement plan quicker than a long-term care event. They are... in remarkably expensive. Um, care can cost in the neighborhood of $10,000 a month uh, is not out of the average. Uh, it, it can drain assets so rapidly. Um, and it's, it's very sad to see because people do a great job saving and it just absolutely disappears uh, with a long-term care event. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so what long-term care is designed and another aspect of this is um, they're designed to uh, reimburse on the cost of care. Uh, another nice thing, if you actually have long-term care insurance, is you're more likely to be able, hopefully, uh, to be able to uh, do in-home care. Uh, what happens a lot, if you do the spend down into Medicare, you eventually get your Medicare um, reimbursement. It's going to be a set amount, and I'll, it might be that you have to go into some sort of retirement home or housing or something like that, because uh, those are typically less expensive than in-home uh, care. So with having actual long-term care set up, hopefully, you know, it, it generally allows people to stay in their homes longer with you know a, a nurse practitioner or someone um you know providing care for them when they need it but still being able to stay in the house um rather than having moved to some sort of facility another big one uh life insurance um so when it comes to life insurance uh and we'll get into a little bit of the nitty-gritty but um 
kind of look at two different types. So employer provided insurance versus personal insurance. So employer provided insurance uh, is great. Uh, you know, typically, you know, more com or companies are going to offer it, but there's going to be a few caveats to it. Um, the biggest one being typically it's going to be temporary insurance. So you will have life insurance for the period of time that you work for that employer. As soon as you leave that employer, you will no longer have life insurance. Um, the other one is, so using, I'm in Colorado, uh, using my state as an example, with, in the state of Colorado, if anything above $50,000 becomes taxable income to the beneficiary, if the, um, if the life insurance policy is paid for by the employer. So what that means is say I have a $150,000 life insurance policy paid for by my employer, 50,000 of it goes to, uh, or the full $150,000 goes to my beneficiaries. 50,000 of it is completely tax-free. Uh, that's just money for them. But that other 100,000, everything above that uh, 50,000, is now taxable income. So for them, it will be as if they made an extra hundred thousand dollars in income that year, uh, which is going to bump them up in some tax brackets and has you know a higher tax bill for them uh, at the end of the year. So there's little things like that uh, that aren't commonly talked about, uh, but are uh, part of the the deal with employer provided insurance. Um, and the biggest thing is that you typically you only have one option. It's typically going to be uh, temporary insurance. It's just for when you work there. With personal insurance, uh, there's lots of different types of life insurance. With personal insurance, you're in the driver's seat. You can get it whatever type you want. Uh, you can change companies as much as you want. Uh, it's your personal life insurance. It has nothing to do with any company or employer or anything like that. Uh, it's It follows you wherever you go. So you're a little bit more in control of it is uh, the, the biggest aspect of personal insurance. Um, biggest things uh, people look for with life insurance is, you know, replacing costs of income, um, <coughs> outstanding debts, like the biggest one people would look at is uh, mortgage, um, you know, and keep the family at home, uh, that kind of stuff. It's uh, basically being able to provide, if somewhere to happen, you being able to provide for your family um, and or leaving some, some type of legacy uh, for, you know, the, the things that you care about. So to get a little bit into uh, more detail, uh, temporary versus uh, permanent life insurance. So um, temporary life insurance, often referred to as term life insurance. Uh, think of that in terms of renting a house. So say I um, have a 10-year term life insurance policy, uh, very similar to if I had a 10-year uh, lease on an apartment. So in that 10 years, I'm covered. Uh, if anything would happen to me, uh, the life insurance would pay out inside those 10 years. But at the end of the 10 years, uh, same as at the end of the lease and apartment, a, I, um, we both kind of go our separate ways. Nothing really happens. Uh, we just kind of move on. Uh, that's the end of it. Uh, permanent life insurance or cash value life insurance, as it's uh, often referred to, is going to be more similar to uh, the purchase of a home. So... The difference and why it's referred to a lot is cash value life insurance is uh, a permanent life insurance policy is going to have what is called cash value inside of it, similar to equity in a house. This is money that you can take out of a policy while you're still living, use for whatever you want. Similar to the purchase of the house as well, there's no you don't really come to the end of a term uh, or anything like that. Um, it's your it's. Uh, it's an asset. It's yours, um, and it will, you know, whether you take uh, or it it will pay someone 
uh, at some point. It's permanent life insurance. That money will go to your beneficiary. Um, and this analogy used to work better, uh, but <laughs> everyone knows uh, rent prices have gone up uh, quite a bit in uh, recent years. But typically, your term uh, or temporary life insurance is going to have a lower premium per month. Uh, than your uh, permanent or cash value uh, uh, life insurance, uh, similar to renting is supposed to cost less than buying a house. Uh, this analogy, again, used to work a lot better. Um, but uh, again, with using the same, with that analogy, with, even though with um, the higher premium on permanent life insurance, you are getting more value out of it. You're rate and equity, uh, you have more options in it uh, versus renting uh, where, you know, you're paying money over every month at the end of the lease or at the end of the term, uh, they keep the money and you move on. So uh, this brings us to our first polling question. So let me get that up for you guys. Uh, so our first uh, pop quiz, which of these companies had a founder that used cash value from a life insurance policy to help the company stay afloat in the early years of the business? So it'd be JCPenney, Disneyland, Theme Park, Pampered Chef, or D. Alt. A few votes get in. All right, we got a few or one for Disneyland, but majority are D, all of them, which is the right answer. So yeah, it is kind of interesting. Uh, the, the cash value, the money you can take out of a life insurance policy or just living um, is a, a very useful financial tool. Uh, it's very become very uh, underutilized uh, in uh, nowadays, but uh, something that is uh, absolutely still available to people to use uh, and you know has been used to create companies or help keep them afloat as well. So... Next, uh, we talk about is uh, accumulation. So, accumulation uh, is kind of like the frame of the house. So, it, for me, it's kind of the more fun aspect of it. So, um, the biggest thing with accumulation is maintaining a balance between your short term and your long term goals. So, a uh, short term goal is maybe something like college funding uh, or uh, another example, you know is uh, um, startup costs for creating a business uh, or down payment for a house. Uh, the, the basics are going to be all the same. Um, college funding, uh, kind of just want to touch on that one. There's a lot of, uh, for those of you who have kids, there's a lot of really good options out there. I'd start young. Um, 529 plans, uh, whatever state you're in, there's usually very good um tax benefits uh, to starting a 529 plan. Uh, another aspect that's being used more and more by families is using 529 plans and pairing it with actual, uh, what it touched on earlier with uh, the cash value life insurance. So people are actually getting life insurance policies on their kids when they're very young uh, so that if you think about it, you have 18 years of buildup. So there's more, there's cash value in that policy uh, that kids can pull out and use for literally anything they want when they're adults. Um, and they're pairing that with a 529 plan. So the strategy is that 529 plans are spectacular, but there's typically going to be some restrictions that the money has to be used on tuition uh, or, you know, uh, something like that, education costs where cash value on a life insurance policy 
can be used for literally anything you want. You just saw that uh, people used it for uh, keeping their businesses going uh, in startup phase. So what they're doing is building up 529 plans and putting that towards tuition costs uh, or whatever it's needed for, and then using cash value of, uh, from a life insurance policy to help with room and board, um, food, uh, all the you know the costs uh, to kind of maintain uh, to make life a little bit easier while you're trying to study and, and get to that. The combined donation of two actually make for a very uh, really cool uh, way to help keep people out of uh, needing student loans at all uh, when they're in uh, that phase. But um, outside of that accumulation. Um, general idea to, or the, the general concept is the same, whether it be for college funding, um, starting a uh, startup cost for a business, uh, um, down payment on a house, everything like that. The main thing is putting into some sort of investment vehicle that you're comfortable with, you know, figuring out what type of investor you are, whether you're okay with taking large risks and you know putting into stocks or something that's gonna be very risky, uh, or you would prefer to have it in something a little bit more safe, maybe like a balanced mutual fund or uh, a bond uh, portfolio or something a little bit more stable or safe. Um, and weighing that and finding that balance versus your long-term goals. So when we talk long-term goals, the most common one is going to be something like retirement planning. So you don't want to basically go over on either side. You don't want to be <clears throat> have everything going into a short-term goal and completely neglect uh, your retirement planning uh, so that, you know, when you're older, you have to suddenly scramble and try to, um, you know, come up with a, a retirement goal very rapidly. Uh, the, the other is the opposite is true that you don't want to neglect uh, maybe like a business startup costs because uh, you've overfunded your retirement planning and um, for more than what you actually would need for the, the type of retirement that you're planning. Uh, the key here is finding the balance uh, and, and, and budgeting it out. So um, uh, Big things too with retirement planning is knowing the tools that are available to you. So three buckets for uh, retirement planning uh, and one has an asterisk on it for a reason and I'll get into that, but um, one uh, taxable, two tax deferred and three tax free income. So one, uh, we have the option there, personal savings. That could also be a personal brokerage account, um, just like a TD Ameritrade uh, where you uh, trade stocks, uh, that kind of stuff. But it'd be a brokerage account, a non, uh, it'd be a technically a non-retirement account. You'd just be using it towards retirement planning um, or just a personal savings account, like at a bank or something like that. Uh, here's the mechanics of it. What you mean by taxable is say I get my, I'll, I'll use my example or myself as an example on all three of these. Say I get my, um, my paycheck. Um, I do the work or two weeks worth of work. That money has tax withholding taken from it. And then I get a paycheck that's direct deposited into my checking account. And then I take that money from a checking account and I put it into a personal savings account, let's say. The money that I took out of my checking account and put into a personal savings account, sorry, tax once, took withholding when they uh, paid me. Um, and um, then I took that and I put it into a personal savings account. The money that I put into the personal savings account is has already been taxed, can't be taxed again. But the gains, the interest that I make on that uh, is what is called ta uh, capital gains. Uh, so that can be taxed. So that's what we mean by taxable. It's the capital gains, the money that I make on my money uh, is taxable uh, by the IRS. Uh, the second option, tax deferred. So that same paycheck, some of that money um, was deviated and went straight into a 401k. 
never did tax withholding, uh, was never taxed at all, went straight into a 401k, has not been taxed uh, by the uh, IRS or anyone. Uh, there was no tax withholding on it or anything. It deviated around that and went straight into a 401k, which is great. Gets to build up, um, you know, buy extra shares, uh, do all that. But the caveat, government always gets their tax money. When an, I go to take money out of a 401k, that money will be taxable at that point because I never paid taxes on it at that point. Um, the money that I, I take out of a 401k, 401k in retirement becomes taxable income. So say I, you know, build up a great retirement and I want to take hundred thousand dollars a year out of my 401k, I'm probably netting around 76,000 of that because it's going to get taxed by the government, uh, as it comes out, uh, it becomes regular taxable income. So that'd be two tax deferred. Same example, uh, I take that uh, same paycheck, um, crosses the uh, the tax line, they take tax withholding and goes into my checking account. And as some of that, I put into personal savings. I took some of it and I also put it into a Roth IRA. Roth IRA, as long as I uh, stay in bounds of what the IRS rules are, which means I have to wait until retirement age, which is at least 59 and a half, the, all the money that I put in there, when I take that money out in retirement is completely tax-free. So the gains, everything is all completely tax-free. There's no capital gains or anything like that in, um, like there is an example one, there's no, uh, Deferred tax, like there is in example two, I already paid the taxes on it, but uh, I do get taxed on it uh, with the tax withholding as uh, regular income. But in example three, when I take that money out in retirement, no tax on the capital gains, it's completely tax free income at that point. That's why there's an asterisk on it. It's not completely tax free. It's, you are getting taxed as regular income to get that money into the Roth for IRA. But uh, when you, you do take that money out in retirement, there's no capital gains, no nothing, tax free. Biggest thing uh, to think about when uh, we talk in terms of retirement planning too is risk tolerance. In there's a lot of like prepackaged, and there's so much stuff on there like saying you should do this, you should do that. It's really you need to know or really think about the type of investor that you are and. Um, create a pack and, and just do what is comfortable with you. So typically when you're younger, you want to be more aggressive uh, because you have time for the, for recovery. Uh, when you get in closer to retirement age, you want to be more conservative that you see a lot like what happened in 2008. Uh, there's a big crash. And a lot of people who were like 64 uh, weren't able to retire because they had were overly aggressive in their investments and that and they all crashed. So as you get closer to retirement age, you want to be more conservative to avoid something like that. Um, and when you're younger, you typically want to be more aggressive uh, and go after uh, the better gains. But how aggressive you want to be and how conservative you want to be when you're older is entirely dependent on what type of investor you are. So there's a lot of uh, you know investor questionnaires out there. What type of investor are you? It's really figuring that out and and you know taking that information. Um, I always say, you know, talk to a licensed financial professional and figure out what's going to be best for you personally, because uh, the cookie cutter uh, trying to package you into something that's not going to be the right fit for you is not uh, not doing the best for you. It's what is going to be the best for you individually. Last thing we'll talk about, roof on the house. Um, so this one kind of gets skipped over, I would say quite a bit. Uh, it's preserving everything you say for all those years when you get into retirement, it's preserving everything uh, and make sure that you distribute it to your loved ones, your things you care about in an efficient manner the way that you want. So 
the big one and the one that I want to mention on here is um, lifetime income products. So decades ago, everyone used to get a pension. It was easier. Everyone just got a pension. You worked for <coughs> a company for years and they gave you a pension. You got that for the rest of your life. Nowadays, uh, most people are on 401k system. It can be a little bit trickier. There are it, it, there are what are called annuities, uh, which are very or almost identical or very very similar to pensions. Uh, they provide lifetime in, income, um, but it's because we're on a four hundred one k system. It's not automatic. Uh, you need to talk with a f licensed financial professional, figure out what, um, you know, how much of that guaranteed income is really needed uh, to fit you best uh, and, and figuring that out and even when to do it. Um, there's a strategy out there that's becoming more and more popular as markets become more and more unpredictable of what is called a deferred annuity. So that is taking a portion, not all, but just a portion out of a 401k and putting it into a deferred annuity, say three to five years to prior to when you plan to retire. So typically what will happen is when you do something like that, uh, whatever insurance company you're buying the annuity from will pay out a little bit more income uh, while you're in in when you're receiving income on there but in that deferred time it just sits there and collects so say i'm 60 and i want to retire when i'm 65 i'll take uh say 15 percent out of my 401k put it into a deferred annuity when it's in that deferred annuity it's immune from the stock market now so say the stock market crashes i don't care because what I took out was to make sure to cover my medical costs, make sure the roof over my head, kind of just the basics of what I need for my retirement. And that money's safe. So that it's sitting there waiting for me when I'm 65. Uh, and then when I'm 65, that uh, the deferment period ends and it provides income for me the same way that a pension would provide income for me um, if we were still in the pension system. Uh, stuff like that is really available out there. A lot of people just aren't utilizing it. Uh, so again, talk to a financial professional. There's, there's a lot of different strategies out there, uh, like that, that can really, you know, help save retirements, uh, and save wealth out there. But, um, biggest thing I hope you take from this, um, is, uh, the phrase, most people don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. Um, the, the biggest thing is just kind of getting started um, and just having a plan and get into it. Uh, somebody smart once told me, uh, you don't wait until you're hungry to plant your seeds. And th th this is so absolutely true in the financial world is you plant your seeds because uh, you're going to need them one day and, and just getting started and, and getting something going. If you're someone who you know puts $10 a week, into a savings account, that's better than being someone who doesn't put $10 a week into a savings account. It's just starting where you are and what you can do uh, to get started down a, a strong financial path um, and, and just getting a plan in place. And um, the plan might change, but at least getting a plan started and, and um, navigating through it. So, um, just a quick review, the thing that we went, or the, the financial house as we go through it, protection, um, you know, what life will throw at you, uh, having that strong foundation. So that's going to be things like emergency savings and insurances, preservation, or I'm sorry, accumulation. It's going to be thing like uh, funding large purchases and retirement plans. Uh, preservation is, uh, you know, uh, every the whole plan. Uh, making sure to put a roof over the top of it and make sure everything's safe. Make sure you have that income for your retirement <coughs> and making sure that, uh, you know, you're, uh, have a legacy or if you have legacy, uh, desires that you want to put out there, then you have that stuff set up. Uh, so that things flow the way that you want. Um, biggest thing on this and this is what I was trying to get out with, uh, having a plan in place. Think about your goals, prioritize your goals, 
develop and a strategy and take action, take action, the biggest part of that, uh, and then update and review uh, your progress at least once a year. Life happens, things change. Uh, the best plans are flexible uh, and, and just make sure that you, you, you're reviewing and making the necessary um, adjustments as you go through uh, as you go through life. So, all right. So we will finish. Once I get this up with our last pop quiz. For those of you who stuck around, I know we're past time, but um, Apple Computers became a publicly traded company on December 12th, 1980, trading at $22 per share. If a person had invested uh, $220 or 10 shares, how much would the shares be worth on December 12th, 2020? So 40 years later. So a little over 30,000, a little over 720,000, a little over 4 million, or an adjusted loss of $127. Looks like you guys are right. Correct answer, $4,098,320. Um, so it just kind of goes to show, starting wherever you're at, you had, uh, in 1980, if you had 200 bucks, 220 bucks in your pocket, um, and you, know, you stayed the course and uh, with your plan and built up, it'd be worth over 4 million today. Um, it's just a, a way that small things can become big things. So um, last thing I'll touch on. So I work uh, with New York Life. I don't work for New York Life. Um, a big thing uh, that I always touch on is uh, there's a saying, uh, don't take uh, big pro or don't take strong promises from weak companies. Uh, so this kind of touches on uh, the annuity products that I spoke about earlier. A uh, thing that happened in 2008 is some insurance companies went under. So insurance companies are typically what sell annuities. And for the people who bought annuities from the insurance companies that went under, uh, they were going to bankruptcy and usually like they were getting around 60 cents on the dollar back. Um, so just doing research on it. So New York Life, Mass Mutual, these are all, you know, very high end companies that are very stable, that had no issues even in 2008. Uh, and just doing your research, uh, uh, some companies will promise you the world, but like I said, uh, don't take strong promises from weak companies. So, uh, last thing we just kind of touched on, um, think about your goals, prioritize, develop, and the biggest update and review your progress. So, uh, with that, that's about all I got for you guys. I appreciate you guys sticking around. I know we went a little bit over, but... Uh, if there's any questions or anything like that, um, I will uh, uh, get to them in the chat. But um, I appreciate you guys uh, hanging out with me. And um, yeah, if there's any uh, questions or anything like that, uh, you should be able to uh, ask in the chat. Um, otherwise, I really appreciate you guys coming out. This was uh, a lot of fun.